In a previous lesson, we studied about the true vine, the true vine. And if you recall, we spoke about the fact that while there is a true vine, there is also a false vine. And we listed the characteristics of the false vine, and we also listed the characteristics of the true vine. This kind of plays into somewhat into, into today's lesson, which is why I'm just taking a minute here to go back over this. Uh, very quickly, and I won't take time with the false vine, but we said that we, we listed the characteristics of each one. The, the roots of the true vine are what? Does anybody recall? What? Divine love, very good. The roots of the true vine are divine love. We said that its nutrients or its soil is what? Grace and liberty. Somebody was taking notes. Good, good. Grace and liberty. The nutrients, what, nut what, what, what uh, is the nutrition to us, what, what gives us the, the nutrients that we need is grace and liberty. I breathe in grace as a, as a Christian. I breathe it. It's my life, grace and liberty. Uh, we said that the framework or the trellis that this, this divine or this vine, true vine grows up is what? O over. Does anybody recall? What is it? Faith and trust. Faith and trust. Very good. While the trellis of the, of the, the false vine is compliance. You comply with the law. Um, we said that the fruit of the true vine. What's the fruit of the true vine? What kind of obedience? Loving obedience. It's a joyful response to a divine love. Loving obedience. While the fruit of the old vine or the false vine is compliant obedience. We said that the growth of the true vine is slow and challenging. Sometimes it's painful because of the pruning. He purgeth it. Every branch that in me brings forth fruit, he purges it that it may do what? Bring forth more fruit. And so it's slow. It's a slow uh, growth and, and challenging. Sometimes it's painful. But its lifestyle is joyful and rewarding. That's where I want to live, don't you? Amen. That's where I want to live, in that vine. And of course, it's based on a relationship and not a religion. Based on a, rela a relationship and not a religion. I have a handout of, of this, of the comparison of these two vines. And if anybody would like it, uh, I'd like all of you to have one. And uh, just come up and see me after the, after the Sunday school lesson. And we can uh, see too that you get uh, one of these handouts. What's the title of the lesson this morning? Leading Christ's Church. Found in Acts 20, verses 17 to 38. And I want us to, I want us to think this morning about this matter of leading Christ's Church. When I started digging out this lesson, I, I had to ask myself, how does this lesson apply or relate to a senior class? How does this lesson apply to you and I? Senior class, leading Christ's church. Don't the pastors lead the church? Doesn't the board lead the church? Don't the leaders, the appointed leaders of the church lead the church? Why would we have a lesson, us laymen, lay ladies, seniors, why would we have a lesson leading Christ's church? I'm sorry, I'm a little hard of hearing. What was it? Good. Our prayer, our praying has a tremendous effect, doesn't it? Our praying. Very good. As seniors, do you and I really have a leadership role in the Lebanon God's Missionary Church? Do we? Why do you say yes, sister? We should. We should. If we take our faith seriously. 
examples and ambassadors. I like that. Is not being an example leadership? Is not being an, uh, an ambassador, being an ambassador of the gospel, of the good news of Jesus Christ, leadership? It is. Uh, you, 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 you hit on something there, Sister Wright. If you and I have a leadership role in the church, what should be our objective? You know, leadership, leadership function, functions, always functions with an objective in mind. We're leading somewhere. We, we're going somewhere. I have a, I have a, a, a graphic on my desk that I really like. Uh, it's, it's a picture. There, there are two pictures, one above the other. And the, the one on the top is a picture of a, like a hay wagon with a group of about five men pulling this hay wagon. And standing at the front in the hay wagon is another man with a whip. And to visualize this in, in your mind, he's cracking this whip over the other five men that are pulling this hay wagon. And the title above that is The Boss. The Boss. The second picture below that, or the, I'm sorry, the title above that is A Boss. A Boss. The second one below that is different. It is a picture of the same hay wagon with the same five men. But now instead of this man standing in the hay wagon, he has come out in front and has joined those five men at the very front of them and is pulling with them. And the title of that is A Leader. A Leader. Doesn't that say it all? Doesn't that say it all? A leader has an objective. He knows where he's going. He's operating on a conviction. If you and I are leaders in the God's Missionary Church here at Lebanon, we have an objective. We should. We should have a purpose, a reason for what we do. What should be our objective? What should be our purpose, our goal? What is it? Teaching others about, about Christ. Good, good, I like that. Teaching others about Christ. What else? Serving one another. Good, good. What else? Loving one another. Yes, very good. I like, um, I, think, I think this objective takes in everything that has been said here this morning as far as an objective goes. Our objective should be that those around us and coming behind us will develop a deep and vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ. If you're a Christian this morning, there's something in you that resonates with that. There's something in you that perhaps finds a, that, that it strikes a passionate Cord, that those around us and those coming behind us will discover a deep and vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ, abounding in grace, abounding in grace. That's my passion today, that those around me, that those coming behind me will discover a deep and vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ, abounding in grace, abounding in grace. It's about, it really is about Finding that true vine that we talked about briefly this morning. That true vine and coming free from the false vine. That's our objective. That's our objective. So, as seniors, how do we achieve that objective? How? How do we achieve that objective? How do we... It, Lebanon God's Missionary Church affect those around us and those coming behind us to develop, to find, to discover a deep and meaningful, vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ abounding in grace. How do we do that? I'm sorry? Lead by example. Very good. Yes. What do we call leading by example? What is that? It starts with an I. 
Who said it? Influence. Very good. Influence. Your influence as a Christian today, who you really are, your influence, your example, the life that you live, is probably one of the most powerful forces in the world. And it can be for good and it can be for evil. Our influence, our influence. Yes. Uh, he didn't tell me how to live. He lived and let me watch it. That's good. I like that. He didn't tell me how to live. He lived and I watched him. I absorbed it. Influence. Influence. And you and I, how we live, how we live, the godly lives that you and I live, the, the lives of character and capability that you and I live, godly, is what probably affects and impacts the people around us, those around us and the generation coming behind us, more than anything else that you and I do or say, the way that we live. Now, influence is one component of leadership. There's another essential component of leadership that we need to talk about. What is it? Servanthood. Servanthood. These two are necessities for you and I to be effective or to have an effective leadership role in the people, with the people around us in the church, in the church. Servanthood and influence. Those are the what. How do we, how do we exercise servanthood? How? How do we exercise servanthood? This is just pretty simple. There's nothing, there's nothing complicated about this. By what? By doing. By, by, who said it? Somebody said it. Serving. By serving. Yes. By serving. We exercise ser servanthood by serving. I serve you, you serve those around you. At Mission Helps, we, um, a number of years ago, we, we wanted to distill or bring together something that would characterize what we really intend to accomplish in serving missions and missionaries. And as a board, we spent considerable time working through this. We worked with, with uh, our, our managers as well. And we ended up with an acronym called CLOSE, CLOSE, C-L-O-S-E. CLOSE stands for caring, listening, observing, serving, and easing the load. Caring, listening, observing, caring out of a, out of a heart of love for those around us, listening to understand them, to really know what's going on in their lives, observing them, observing their lives, their needs for, for things that they need, and then serving, serving those people to ease their load, ease the load. We did a lot of serving yesterday. I was thinking about that. There were those of you here yesterday that really filled a servant role in what you did. And it must have been a big job. Oh, bless your hearts. And you all work together. Servanthood. Serving. It's beautiful. Serving. Yes. Yeah. Serving. We exercise servanthood by serving one another, by being observant, by listening, by stepping in to help ease one another's loads where there's a concern. But also, in, in fulfilling our duty, our role as seniors, as leaders within the a leadership role within the church, we are also charged with influence, with influence. And how would, 
What, what would be one word that might characterize this influence or might be the key that unlocks our influence? Consistency. Consistency is good, yes. It's, it, 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 um, it, it's a part of our character, isn't it? We're consistent. We have integrity. Our words and our actions match, don't they? Consistency. We're consistent in our lives. Good, good. An example, yes. And I think that goes along with consistency, an example. I'm looking for another word, though, that, that really is the key that unlocks your and my influence. Without this, our influence is impotent. Our influence is, is severely diminished. Faith, possibly? What is, I'm sorry? The love of God, yes, that's good. And the love of God is, 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 the found, is foundational to our influence. Unfortunately, in the, in the English language, the word love, as we use it, doesn't truly convey the essence, the depth, the, the, the breadth of God's love. Uh, we see it in, in 1 Corinthians 13, where Paul describes agape love. But because of that, I think there's another word. And you're right, divine love is, is at the foundation of this. But there's another word that is the key that unlocks our influence. When you and I possess this, and it's genuine in our lives, our influence takes hold and people take notice. What is it? Compassion. Compassion, you're close, you're hot, brother, you're red hot. Compassion is a good one, is a good one. In fact, Probably this is the same, they're both the same. Probably synonyms. I'm looking for another word. Caring. Caring. Darlene, thank you. Caring. Caring. Show me a man or a woman who deeply cares about somebody. And I'll show you a man or a woman that welds a powerful influence in that person's life. You and I cannot influence people for good unless we truly care from our hearts about them. Caring. There's an old saying that says, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And it's then that influence is unlocked with you and I and begins to take hold. Now, just a note, of, uh, a note of clarification. This kind of caring that we're talking about today is not a clingy, intrusive, or overbearing approach into the lives of people. Think about that for a minute. We need to be cautious and careful lest we become clinging or intrusive into the lives of people or overbearing. But rather, it's a genuine loving kindness that flows out of a heart of divine love. In fact, I would say it's a, it's a, a divine sense of love, a divine love that flows out of a heart that has been justified and sanctified and filled with the Holy Spirit. That's where real caring begins to come begins to happen and flow out of our hearts. Leadership through servanthood and influence, those two are necessary. For you and I to have an impact on people around us, an impact on the generation coming up behind us, it takes our engaging in servanthood by serving and our engaging in influence by caring. I care. All of these are woven into the lesson today, found in Acts chapter 20. And uh, we want to see where, we want to look at what Paul had to say. I think we would all agree this morning that Paul, probably more than any of the apostles or any of the, the writers of the New Testament, 
had the greatest influence and had the greatest effect as a leader, as a leader. Now, you may be thinking, well, I can never be an Apostle Paul. No, and neither will I. Ne neither will any of us be probably an Apostle Paul. But the fact is, the Apostle Paul engaged in servanthood and influence by caring. Servanthood by serving and influence by caring. He cared, he loved, he served. And he speaks about that. It's woven throughout the lesson today. First of all, uh, notice how these, uh, the keys to this objective is, are demonstrated. And what, what did we say was the, our, should be our objective? What did we say should be our objective? That those around us and those coming behind us should what? Find us faithful good, but more than that, more than that, that those coming behind us, those around us should develop what? A deep and vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ. Oh, let this grip our hearts this morning. That the people around us, that those coming behind us, the generation coming behind us, will discover a deep and vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ. Abounding in grace. Abounding in grace. Abounding in grace. That was Paul's objective. Everywhere he went. It was his desire that men and women would discover, would develop, find a deep and vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ, abounding in grace. Beginning with verse 17 of the lesson, and from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. Paul had arrived in Miletus. Miletus was just south of Ephesus. Uh, and he was, this, he was on his third missionary journey and on his way back to Jerusalem, he would have liked, I'm sure, would have liked to have stopped in Ephesus and visited the church there. He had founded that church and he was very close to them. In fact, he had pastored that church. But uh, he, he felt compelled to get to Jerusalem. And so he wasn't, didn't feel like he could take the time to swing over to Ephesus and visit the, the church there. So he called the elders to come to him. And, and this is what he had to say to them as we go through the lesson. Verse 18, And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons. With you at all seasons. What, what is Paul, what, what in your mind would Paul be referring to by saying he was with them at all seasons? or in, in all seasons? In the good times and in the bad times. When the going got rough, he wasn't out of there like some would do. He stuck with it. He was with, and why? 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 He cared. He cared. And you look at Ephesus, the church of Ephesus at that point, his influence had been powerful because he cared. He stuck with it through all of the seasons, the good times and the rough times. When the going got tough, he stayed with it. Verse 19, serving the Lord with all humility of mind. What do we see Paul engaging here in, in, the, in this thing of leadership? What do we see? Which one of the two do we see? Serving the Lord. What is that? Servanthood. Servant, and that's the basis of our serving others. In your serving other people, and you're being a servant to them, you and I are serving whom? Jesus Christ. For inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Serving, serving the Lord, verse 19, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and with many tears and temptations or trials, which befell me by the lying in weight of the Jews. This humble, he speaks of all humility of mind. This is a humble, meek, kind spirit that characterized Paul. I, liked, I like Strong's uh, definition of the humility that Paul was talking about. Strong said this is a uh, humility, modesty, lowliness, humble-mindedness, humble a sense of moral insignificance, and a humble attitude or unselfish concern for the welfare of others. 
a humble attitude and an unselfish concern for the welfare of others. And that really characterizes this thing of character. A deep and abiding concern for the welfare of others, for you and for others. That characterized Paul. And what this humility of mind, this humility of mind, what, what role in his leadership, in his leadership, or what part in his leadership role did this play? It was influence. It was influence. The people saw the man that he was. And it was an influence, bringing them to the point of a deep and abiding relationship, a vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ, filled with grace. Steady in tears and in trials. Steady in tears and in trials. When the going got tough again, he stayed with it. Influence, demonstrating his genuine faith in God. Verse 20. And how I kept nothing back that was profitable unto you. What was he doing here? I kept nothing back that was profitable to you. What was he doing? Influence. Influence. Yes. What else? What else? I, what does a servant do? Keeps nothing back, does he? I'm serving you. I kept nothing back that was profitable. Now, it might have been that he kept nothing back in sharing the gospel, the truth with them. But I can see Paul as well sharing out of whatever he had to give and to share with the people at Ephesus, being a servant and serving them and their needs, serving them and influenced by caring and caring for them. He served them. Caring, he cared. It was a selfless giving to benefit to the benefit of others. Verse 21, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Testifying faithfully to the Jews and to the Greeks or the Gentiles. Speaking to them, telling them about their need of God. And did this come out of a, you're all going to hell and you need God's spirit? What was it? What kind of a spirit? A caring spirit. A caring spirit. And I've watched and you've seen that when... A man or a woman brings a deep sense of caring and a burden to the picture of sharing Christ with somebody. The Spirit of God uses that. And I've watched in dismay as I've watched other men in their zeal hammer non-Christians that you've got to get saved, you're going to hell. And it turned them away and turned them off caring spirit. We're talking about influence today, our influence. And folks, if you and I can have an influence, we'll have an influence on the generation coming behind us. It's going to mean a caring spirit, a genuine caring, and genuine servanthood by serving, by serving. I liked what he said here in verse 21, testifying both to the Jews and also the Greeks. Did you catch what he said? Repentance toward whom? Toward God and? Faith, what? Toward Jesus Christ. There is our salvation in a nutshell, isn't it? Repentance toward God, to, to whom, or uh, in who, toward whom we've sinned, and faith in Jesus Christ, who made the atonement for those sins and redeems us back to God. This is the gospel story in a nutshell. Repentance toward God and faith in Jesus Christ. And you and I can take this and use it in our, in our witnessing with others, in our sharing Christ out of a caring heart to others. Repentance toward God and faith in Jesus Christ. Moving on to verses 22 to 24, Paul continues to speak to the, the elders at Ephesus. And now behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. 
He is, he is expressing the, the deep faith and trust that he has lived with all these years in a God that he knows to be faithful and trustworthy. And his life, his life, his influence has demonstrated that faith and trust and that indeed it's real in him. And because of that, because of his, his consistency, his consistency in the way that he lived and his consistency in trusting God and believing God, his consistency in exercising the role of a servant, his consistency in caring about other people, Paul was used of God to have a tremendous influence on others. Verse 32, and now brethren, I commend you to God and to the world of, and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. He is, Paul is now saying, brethren, I'm leaving this world. I'm moving on, but I'm giving you, I'm passing the torch to you. And after Paul had founded this church and had given himself to this church, it is remarkable and exemplary of him to say, brethren, I'm entrusting you with this work now. I'm giving it to you. I'm passing it on to you. And so again, you see how much he cares. He's willing to give them now the opportunity to move forward with God, to find the leadership of God, to exercise the leadership roles that God has called them to, and to be the men of God that they need to, to develop and become as God allows them. Have you ever found it hard to let go of something? To just let go? Let go? Now there's an old saying that if, if you really love somebody, what? You let them go free. If you really love somebody, let them go free. They'll come back to you if it was meant to be. If we really love people, this is hard, it's difficult. Uh, we're not parents, but I've, I'm sure you who are parents have wrestled with, how do I let go of my children? How do I let go? I watched my dad wrestle with this. He did very well. My mom and my dad both did very well with this in turning us loose and letting us go. It's gotta be tough. It's gotta be tough. Letting go. But in letting them go, we're de you're demonstrating that you care. You're serving them by giving them the opportunity to now grow and find their way in God. A mentor to a mentee, a leader to the next generation leaders, letting go, letting go. Paul was letting go, hearing what he said, because he cared, because he served. He was a servant. Leadership, servanthood by what? Serving? and influence by caring. I want you to get that this morning. I want you to get that. Leadership, our leadership as a class here this morning, our role in the church this morning, leadership by servanthood through serving. Leadership through influence by what? Caring, caring. by caring. Verse 33. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. He is content and is at rest with whatever and however God provides for him. And in fact, I think Paul was really saying, I am rejoicing about your successes. I'm not, I'm not jealous about your success. I'm glad for your success. I'm rejoicing in it. I covet no man's silver or gold or apparel. Demonstrating leadership through servanthood by serving and influence by caring. He cared. Verse 34, yea, you yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. Paul was willing to work hard, get down in the mud and work when he needed to with the rest of the people. He was the kind of leader that got off the wagon. Remember that one? Got off the wagon, went to the front of the line and started pulling with his men. That was Paul, a real leader. He worked with his hands and he also ministered to the needs of those around him. He cared, he served, 
He was a real leader. Leadership. Verse 35, I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought also to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, how he said, it is what? More blessed to give than to receive. And you know, that really is where the blessing is here. In our serving and in our caring about people, it's always more blessed to give than to receive. Leadership, leadership. And when he had spoken thus, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. I think this is one of the most powerful things. If it comes out of a heart of a servant, and if it comes out of a heart of a man or a woman who cares, praying with somebody is probably one of the most influential acts of leadership that you and I can exercise, engage in. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. And you see that the objective, his objective, Paul's objective, that, that the people around him and those coming up behind him would develop and find a deep and vibrant, meaningful relationship with Jesus Christ abounding in grace. You see that that objective was, a, was achieved. Verse 37, and they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all the words that he had spoke, that he spoke, he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him into the ship. The objective was achieved. And it continues. It continues in our lives today. And to me this morning, this is this is the challenge. That my life and that your life would be a life of servanthood and influence that makes us leaders in this generation. That's what leadership in the church is all about. Every one of us has a role to fill. And so as seniors, what should our leadership objective be? I know there's a lot of words in that, that little saying, but if you'll just think of it as one thing, the people around me, the people coming behind me, find Jesus. Know Jesus. Know Jesus. A deep and meaningful, vibrant relationship with Jesus. That's our objective as leaders in the church. The people around you, and the people coming behind you. Find and know Jesus Christ. And how do we do that? How do we achieve that? What are the two keys that, we, that are essential to achieving that objective, that the people around us find Jesus and know Jesus? What are the two keys that unlock that, that cause that to happen? What are they? Servanthood. Servanthood and we do that by what? Influence. By serving. And what's the other one? Influence. influence. And we influence, our influence goes out, is unlocked. Is unlocked by what? Caring. By caring that springs out of divine love. A divine love that is put into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Serving and caring. Serving and caring. Just a question on the practical side. How are some, what are some things that you and I can do that engage us in serving and demonstrate caring. Quickly. Yesterday, with the Keystone, with the Keystone Choir, right? A number of you were engaged in serving and caring and the, and the influence. What else? What are some practical things? Quickly, anybody? Visiting the sick. Visiting the sick, very good. Caring for the widow, excellent, excellent. Some more. Things that you can do, that you and I can do. Give me some ideas. Give me some ideas, would you? Pray for one another. Pray for one another. I like that. Yes. Pray for yeah, one another. Send a card. Send a card. Good. Send a card. What else? What are some more things? Quickly. I'm sorry? Making meals. Making meals. Good. Some of you are gifted with making meals. Make meals. Some more. Yes. 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 What did you say there? Our what? Our time. Our time. 
our time. Caring about somebody, genuine caring about somebody, will always take your time. If I don't have time to give people, I don't care. Genuine caring requires our time. And I think that's probably at the heart and core of what caring is all about. I give you my time. I give you my time. Very good. Brother Jerry, you were going to say something? 